asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. So to the Russian spy story then. Was he poisoned? Wasn't he poisoned? Well, on Sunday, you know by now, former Russian double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter, well, they collapsed on a bench in a supermarket in Salisbury. Very distressing for them and their family. Now, they're they're in hospital. Their condition has been described as critical. And I'm not on the BBC News webpage at the moment. Things can change. But just as I was coming to where their condition described as critical, Wiltshire Police said today, for most of the day, that the couple had no visible injuries and an investigation is now underway to determine whether or not a crime has in fact been committed. Toxicology tests and all of that were taking place today. Counter-terrorism police are, have now taken over the investigation. His story is an interesting story, Sergei Skripal. He's a double agent. Um, he was convicted of passing the identities of Russian intelligence agents who were working undercover in Europe. Well, he was convicted of giving their identities to MI6 and a military court in Russia sentenced him to 13 years. But he was one of four prisoners released by Moscow in exchange for 10 US spies as part of a swap. And he was later on flown to the United Kingdom. That's who he is. So he was found on a bench and he was taken to hospital. Just having a look there and... As far as I can tell, that's about as up-to-date as things are at the moment. But because this is getting blanket coverage, things will change, no doubt. Look, the media are loving it, right? They are. Um, And it's dominated news coverage here today. I've been listening to it since the early a.m., out jogging, listening to BBC Breakfast Radio and watching it throughout the day. Now, as I mentioned, throughout the day, the police have said they don't know they can't say what happened, nor if a crime has been committed. It's important to to uh, reiterate that. But the media, of course, doesn't let things such as no evidence get in the way of a good story. So Sky and BBC today have shamelessly, and it is shameless stuff, paraded a bevy of beauties in the guise of politicians, journalists, Russians living in the UK, defectors, All these people have come on and said that it's obvious, in their opinion, that Russian intelligence is indeed behind it and that Vladimir Putin himself probably gave the order. It's extraordinary stuff when the police are saying we don't know what happened. Now, former UK Foreign Secretary um, Malcolm Rifkind was allowed to get away with strongly hinting at Putin's involvement this morning on BBC Radio 5. That's available on the BBC iPlayer. It's quite staggering, really. Rifkin said, well, you know, strongly this smacks of Putin. And neither of the Five Life presenters challenged him, which is their job. It's their job to say, well, how do you know that? Please, Mr Rifkin, tell us how you know that it's probably Putin, it's probably the Russians. Anyway. The current UK Foreign Secretary is Boris Johnson. You know this. Here he is today responding to an urgent question on it. This is Boris Johnson, UK Foreign Secretary, on the, well, on the poisoning story or the alleged poisoning story. Honourable members will note the echoes of the death of Alexander Litvinenko in 2006. And while it would be wrong to prejudge the investigation... I can reassure the House that should evidence emerge that implies state responsibility, then Her Majesty's Government will respond appropriately and robustly. As I say, Mr Speaker, it is too early to speculate as to the precise nature of the crime or attempted crime uh, that has taken place uh, in Salisbury yesterday. But I'm going to have a pop anyway. But I know members... (laughs) It's too early to speculate, but but I know... ...members will have their suspicions. And what I will say to the House is that if those suspicions prove to be well-founded, then this government will take whatever measures we deem necessary 
to protect the lives of the people in this country, our values and our freedoms. And oh, our values and our freedoms, eh? And though I am not now pointing fingers, because we cannot, Mr Speaker, as you'll understand, point fingers. Just after a whole load of finger pointing went on. I say to governments around the world that no attempt to take innocent life on UK soil will go either unsanctioned or unpunished. Yeah, he's a tough guy, Boris Johnson. Then Johnson made a threat which has caused great mirth amongst the Westminster press or the press that covers events at Westminster caused much glee. Johnson made a threat about this summer's World Cup, which in case you don't know, Russia is hosting. In fact, we're a hundred days away from the first game. This is what Johnson said about the World Cup. <laughs> if things turn out to be as uh, many members, I think, on both sides, I suspect that they are, to return to that, uh, that formula, uh, I think we will have to have a serious conversation about our engagement with Russia. What? And uh, for my own part, I think it will be very difficult to see uh, how we can, uh, thinking ahead to the, to the World Cup this July, uh, this summer, I think it will be very difficult to uh, imagine that UK representation at that event could go ahead in, in the normal way, and we would certainly have to uh, consider that. Oh. Wow. Now, Gary Neville, former England and Manchester United captain, didn't pull any punches and said that Johnson is a quote now, useless fool. <laughs> and why bring football into it? That was Gary Neville. Uh, very quickly, the Foreign Office came out to say that Johnson meant that diplomats and officials might not travel to the tournament. Don't panic, said the Foreign Office. He didn't mean that England wouldn't participate. 100 days to the World Cup. I don't know, I wonder... Dear listener, will this reach a crescendo? Not just the Sergei Skripal story, but other stories about Russia. Will they reach a crescendo? And will that crescendo lead to either countries boycotting the World Cup, we're back to the Moscow Olympics of 1980, or FIFA decides to, at the last minute, ask England to host the World Cup? I wonder. What day did I say that? Because I never get anything right. I'm not Nostradamus. 6th of March 2018, Richie said the World Cup might be in England in 2018, in the summer. It won't be, but you never know. Now, El País is the second most read newspaper in Spain on the internet, and it's also the second most circulated daily newspaper in Spain. I know El País very well. It's based in Madrid, and in my talk, Radio Europe Days... I used to speak to their journalists quite often. El País is claiming that it has evidence that Russia tried to influence Sunday's election in Italy. Yeah. Yeah. No, they are. But El País has no evidence. The Spanish article is essentially a monumental load of bollocks. It cites social media analysis done by a private firm. And the private firm alleges that Sputnik, which is a Russian news outlet, basically dominated the discussion around the election in Italy. Yeah, right. Sputnik, apparently, radicalised the debate about the election by making it all about Im immigration. It's the Russian bots. The Russians influenced the result and brought the anti-establishment parties to the successful result they had on Sunday. Five star and all that. Systematic. Rain or shine. See, when you can't sing, everything you sing sounds the same. Are those the songs Five Star had hits with Systematic and Rain or Shine? Yeah, Five Star had a great result, according to El Pais, because Sputnik radicalised the discussion by making it about immigration. I think the Italians didn't need any help to be pissed off by immigration, right? Just me? It's garbage. Now, former MP George Galloway, these days, of course, works for RT. He had this to say about the allegations 
about Russia and Sergei Skripal. Have a listen to Galloway. Well, it would be a serious matter if uh, Russian intelligence or any foreign intelligence was going around attempting to murder people on British soil. And that would be true whether I was the foreign secretary uh, as it is if uh, Boris Johnson is the foreign secretary. So there was nothing in what he just said that uh, was unusual. And uh, clearly we're in an atmosphere of heightened Russophobia. I don't think that's putting it too highly. Uh, the McMafia television affair, the constant uh, propaganda against Russia in Britain and in the United States is bound to be fertile ground for conspiracy theorists. That doesn't mean that it wasn't a conspiracy, but there's certainly no evidence yet that there was a conspiracy, still less that the Russian state was involved. Um, I always ask myself uh, in these circumstances, would Russia be stupid enough to carry out such an act two weeks before the Russian presidential election and exactly 100 days before the World Cup in Russia. After all, Russia, if it wanted to, could have killed this man at any time. And that's a very good point, isn't it? Russia could have killed this man at any time if the deep state intelligence agencies of Russia wanted to do it. Why now? Galloway makes some very good points there, it must be said. And to be fair to Galloway, as any right-thinking person should do, you can't say for a fact that the Russians weren't behind it. This is, of course, this is what plagues the independent media, the truthers, because Russia is doing the right thing in Syria and it's holding back the Zionists. So therefore, anything which throws Russia into a bad light, we must deny it. Well, you can't do that. We don't know that Vladimir Putin or the KGB or the FSB is not behind it. I'm with Galloway. I don't think it's likely that they are because we're in this tidal wave of never-ending anti-Russian nonsense, aren't we? We know this, right? So I don't believe it fits in with the Russian agenda. It doesn't make any sense. But you can't come out and say this happened or this did not happen because we don't know. But we can say that UK media is disgraceful in its approach to the story by bringing all of these people out of the woodwork to say that, oh, it smells like Putin. That's rubbish journalism. Rubbish. And I've got an example of it for you. W wouldn't I just have an example of it for you? Heidi Blake is the investigations editor with BuzzFeed. Heidi says that there is overwhelming evidence that loads of murders debts, murders, debts, loads of them, 14 of them anyway, can be linked to the Russians. But Heidi says, for some strange reason, the UK police is ignoring it, despite the fact that UK police has been provided with evidence. This is strange stuff. Heidi Blake, BuzzFeed Investigations Editor. I think this this is a big step change. I mean, we, we could see from our reporting last year that there was growing pressure on the British government and British intelligence agencies to take seriously the threat of Russian assassinations in Britain. Um, the senior serving US intelligence sources we spoke to were very angry about Britain's failure to take a firm line. Um, and they spoke out in our reports and I think that that has resonated. I think also growing concern about Russia's interference in Western democracies has contributed to, to you know, heightening concern about, about this threat. And so it's good to see this being taken seriously. It does seem that a tipping point has been reached. It's good to see growing pressure across the political spectrum for a full inquiry into not just this attempted assassination, but the 14 other cases we've identified, which as yet have not been properly investigated. Yeah, no evidence. But hang on, Heidi, isn't it true that some of the families of men who have died that you claim were murdered, isn't it true that some of these families have said they do not suspect Russia? And in fact, they think that their, their bereavement 
is being exploited to ferment anti-Russian sentiment? That's a very good question. What does Heidi Blake say to that? I think the evidence in in, in the cases that we've looked at is so overwhelming. What I evidence? Think it's not credible to suggest that this is just a campaign to smear Russia. Um, I mean, quite the contrary. These are cases where there is overwhelming evidence of, of Russian involvement in, in many of these deaths and there's been nothing done about it by the British authorities. I think it's understandably very difficult for the families of some of the people involved um, to speak out. People are, are understandably scared for their own lives. Um, that may or may not be the case with Tatiana Peripolichny. I'm, I'm aware that that is her position. This, this is hearsay. And the presenter, who's a, a woman called Jane Secker, Jane should be jumping in there and saying, this is hearsay. Show me some evidence that these families of these 14 other cases down the years are convinced that their husbands were murdered by the Russian deep state. Show me some evidence. And don't tell me, Heidi, that you were told by US intelligence agencies. Because I laugh myself silly if that is your evidence. Well, we were told by the CIA. Oh, well, it must be true then. She goes on. Uh, but in many of the other cases we've identified, there are family members who are crying out for an investigation into the deaths of their, their loved ones and, and still looking for answers. Yeah. Who are they? You see, this is where the presenter should jump in. Who are they? Name them. Who are these people? Years after their deaths, and I know that they would welcome a full inquiry. Who are they? It's rubbish. Again, rubbish journalism, rubbish presenting from Sky News' Jane Secker. I must be sexist. Loads of evidence, says Heidi, but gives you none. You see, Heidi is a glove puppet. There is a long arm inserted in Heidi through the anal cavity. And the hand at the end of that arm is working her pretty hard. Rubbish. You know, anybody who's ever covered court cases as a journalist, as a, as a producer of talk radio or television, will know that this sort of stuff is kept from juries by objections from counsel and objections sustained by the presiding judge, the objections based on its hearsay. You can't say it's hearsay. It's hearsay. Oh, there are families concerned. Who are these families? Let's get them on the record. Let's get them in the studio. And we'll ask them why do they think they're, if indeed they do think that, why they think that um, their husbands were, were murdered by the deep state. It's propaganda, is what it is. It's dreadful. I wonder about the World Cup, which is due to kick off, as I said, in 100 days' time. How much more of this is going to go on? We're going to take a very quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk for a couple of minutes about Syria, because there have been more claims today, more claims, fresh claims, that the Assad government has um, basically used chemical weapons, chlorine gas against against people in eastern Ghouta. Again, these claims haven't been substantiated, but they are being made and they are not being challenged. We'll talk about that briefly when I come back. So to Syria then, medics in the rebel-held eastern Ghouta area of Syria say they have been treating people with breathing problems after a suspected chlorine attack. This is according to the BBC. These reports follow government airstrikes and shelling just hours after the last UN aid envoy left the enclave following a supposed five-hour truce. Syria denied the allegations, said it had not carried out the attack, dismissing them as an act of desperation by Western powers. That's the official line from the Syrian government. Here's Sky News reporter Alex Rossi, who's actually based in Damascus. Alex Rossi. Well, this is uh, coming from activists and medics inside Eastern Ghouta. This is the besieged rebel enclave, a suburb of Damascus. According to medics, uh, 30 people are being treated uh, for suffocation. It's believed that they may have uh, been exposed in a chlorine attack. Now, it's very difficult, of course, for us to verify that. Uh, there have been allegations against the Syrian government of chlorine attacks before in eastern Ghouta, uh, something that they strongly deny. We can't verify it, says Rossi. This is the key sentence in the report. We can't verify it. There have been reports which the Syrian government denies. We can't verify them. But we're going to keep making these allegations anyway. We're going to allow 
another party constantly say the Syrian government is targeting its own civilians with chemical weapons, we can't verify it, but we're going to allow people come on the air and say this time and time and time again. Are you with me? You understand it, right? Right. This is basic journalism. Now, in terms of the levels of violence, it seems that they are uh, escalating on all sides. We, yesterday, were out with the aid convoy. We travelled with it to the last point in Syrian government territory before it then went into eastern Ghouta. Now, there is supposed to be a supposed five-hour uh, truce, a cessation of hostilities, but throughout the time uh, that we were at that frontline position, I heard the sound of artillery, I heard rocket fire, I also heard jets in the skies as well, and much louder, much denser uh, sounding um, explosions, which I assume uh, were airstrikes. Now, according to people trapped inside Eastern Ghouta, they claim that it has been extremely intense. They accuse the Syrian government of carrying out uh, what they call a scorched earth policy, deliberately targeting uh, civilians. Now, that now, he doesn't provide any evidence that Syrians trapped in Eastern Ghouta are claiming that the Assad government is deliberately targeting civilians. He provides no evidence of this. He just says, according to civilians in Ghouta, the Assad government is deliberately targeting them. But there's no evidence. None. This is a post-fact world. I've been using that term now for nearly two years. It is a post-truth, post-fact world. Facts don't matter. People can say what it is they want to say. They can claim what it is they want to claim. And they do not have to provide you with any evidence. Right? It's the way it is. Civilians. Now, that is something that has been robustly denied by the Syrian government. They say that they are, ta um, they are targeting terrorist groups inside that enclave. They claim that the people inside are being held there against their will on the most part as human shields. And that really what they are trying to do is restore security and sovereignty to that part of uh, the, the, the capital. We'll give him 6 out of 10 for that. He at least pointed out a couple of times that the Syrian government absolutely refutes these allegations. We'll give him a little bit of credit for that. Alex Rossi there, who is based in Damascus, but hasn't been in or around eastern Ghouta for obvious reasons. The government is saying, look, there are nutters, um, or, or there were nutters totally in charge of that area. It's basically on the doorstep of Damascus. We've had to do it. We have done everything we can to minimise civilian casualties. We're obviously not targeting civilians. We want the nutter Wahhabi jihadists out of that part of um, the city, eastern Ghouta. That's what we want to do. That's what they're saying. And that's what makes sense. It does not make sense that the government or the army would deliberately try to kill innocent civilians and would deliberately use chemical weapons on innocent civilians. Remember, these are the same journalists who told you many, many years ago that the Iraqi military were taking Kuwaiti babies out of incubators, stealing the incubators and leaving the babies to die. It turned out to be a crock of shit. These are the same people who told you that Gaddafi was murdering his own people, that he was on the verge of sacking cities in Libya, killing hundreds of thousands of people. It emerged It emerged in a parliamentary uh, inquiry in the UK in 2015 that all of this was exaggerated. So why would you believe it today? You can't say for sure, Richie, that Assad is not targeting civilians. Of course I can't, because I'm not there. I'm here. But how many times are you going to be lied to? How many times are you going to be told the same story, except the characters change? Hussein, Gaddafi, Assad, killing their own people, using chemical weapons against his own people, the regime, the regime. At some point you've got to say, I'm not believing this anymore, until I see some concrete evidence of it. Even if Bashar al-Assad was some sort of James Bond villain, some sort of lunatic. Um, there's nothing for him to gain by giving his enemies that stick to beat him with 
by using chemical weapons anywhere in the country, number one, or two, using them against innocent Syrians, whether they supported his government or not. It's nonsense. It's 25 and a half minutes to the top of the air. Tuesday's Richie Allen Show. Don't forget William Binney. Uh, Bill Binney, uh, NSA whistleblower extraordinaire, former technical director at the National Security Agency and a Russian specialist. Bill will join the programme to talk about these issues in the second hour and that's not too far away. Plenty to get through in the meantime though. So let's crack on to some more very interesting things to talk to you about. Now North Korea. Here's a story that is um, gathering pace this afternoon. Apparently, the North, as in North Korea, is willing to talk about getting rid of its nuclear weapons, but only if its own safety can be guaranteed. Who says? Well, South Korea says. The South says the subject was raised when its officials met with the North and Kim Jong-un in Pyongyang on Monday during a rare visit. They said, and everybody's listening to this with ears wide open, They said that Mr. Kim is also open to talking to the United States and that he would pause weapons testing. In previous programmes, to halt its nuclear ambitions, the North has failed to keep its promises, according to the BBC and Reuters. The leaders of North and South Korea have also agreed to meet at a summit next month, and that's according to Seoul's uh, envoy, envoy. It will be the first such meeting for more than a decade, and the first since Kim Jong-un took power in North Korea. Mark Austin is based in Washington, D.C. for Sky News. What do the Americans make of the North Korean announcement? Or the South Korean announcement about the possibility that the North will give up its weapons program? Well, it could be highly significant. Uh, The point to make, I think, at this stage is this is largely a South Korean initiative rather than an American one. But if the North Koreans really are prepared to talk to the Americans, prepared to give up their nuclear weapons, prepared while those talks go on to halt the nuclear program and stop uh, missile tests, then it really is uh, highly significant. The, The interesting question is how Donald Trump will react to all this. We've only got a tweet from him so far. He may speak Uh, later today on it. Uh, But what he said on Twitter is this, possible progress being made in talks with North Korea. For the first time in many years, a serious effort is being made by all parties concerned. The world is watching and waiting. Maybe false hope, but the US is ready to go hard in either uh, direction. And what's interesting really is whether this is happening because of Donald Trump or despite Donald Trump. Um, There's a view that the South Koreans have intervened here um, because they were worried that uh, Trump's threats and brinkmanship uh, might lead to uh, disaster. There's another view that it was just those very threats that brought the North Koreans uh, to the table in the way they have. But look, you know, this could be false hope. As uh, Donald Trump says, the North Koreans will almost certainly want something in return uh, from the Americans. They'll almost certainly want them to halt uh, military exercises with the South Koreans. That's doable. They may ask them to remove uh, American troops from so close to the North Korean border. That probably won't be possible. But they will overall, and when the talks take place, be seeking uh, security guarantees uh, they want this is all about basically regime survival they want the north korean regime uh, to survive they want guarantees from america uh, that that uh, or they will ensure that 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 happens yeah all good if it's true now aiden foster carter is a korean expert and he's based at the university of leeds what does them um, well, what does he think of it? Well, it's certainly much more than I expected. I think like most commentators, I'd erred on the side of caution. You know, we had this uh, thaw for the Winter Olympics, which I, was a huge relief to South Korea and perhaps to the whole world after, if you remember, all the tensions of the last year, trading of, uh, of, of insults on Twitter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I didn't expect it to go this far this fast. I mean, we don't, of course, have a complete outbreak of peace and love the end on the peninsula, I wish. There's a long way to go for that. But a summit meeting, I mean, a, a, on a number of fronts, this has moved faster today than I expected. So a precious, fragile space has opened up. We have to see what will fill it. Having spent decades expanding its nuclear capabilities, is it really feasible to uh, believe that North Korea could give it all up? 
I think the one word answer would have to be no. Uh, Kim Jong-un is more noted for in the six or seven years he's been in power. He's greatly accelerated the nuclear and especially the missile programs. And he's written North Korea's nuclear status into its constitution and the statutes of its ruling party. Backing out of that isn't going to be uh, easy. But I think the key thing when we come, we're far from this now, but if it comes to substantive talks with America, with whoever, is about what security guarantees could be offered, what might be traded for what but the very fact that he's prepared to put it on the table to say he will i mean that in itself is a, a step forward that we should uh, we should grasp yeah aiden foster carter there who knows what to make of it iran we know has no ambition to make a nuclear weapon north korea evidently has um as far as iran goes there's no evidence that it was ever actively constructing one um but israel has been lying on a daily basis saying that iran is in breach of its deal so any deal with the North Koreans who have harboured ambitions to to create a nuclear weapon that can be launched in defence of itself, any deal that might be done, well, you'd have to be, you'd have to take it with a big pinch of salt, wouldn't you? Um, you know, like Russia, North Korea is surrounded. And... A number of commentators today were making the point that one of the concessions North Korea would want is, is that basically the United States military disappears out of the South China Sea. But of course, the United States is not going to do that. Of course, the Israelis, <laughs> Israel has nuclear weapons but won't admit it. So don't get me started. 19 minutes to the top of the hour. At Richie Allen Show on Twitter. That's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Um, number of people. Tweeting on this, uh, Sean McDonald, Tony Allars, Millie, how you doing, Millie, uh, who referred me to an article apparently that Peter Hitchens wrote, which was critical of the BBC's decision to use unverified footage that the BBC said had come from Eastern Ghouta. Apparently, Peter Hitchens wrote, I didn't see the article, Millie, you might send me a, a, a link to it, but apparently Hitchens was saying, well, why would you broadcast footage without first of all verifying that the footage was actually impartial, that it was genuine footage. That's a very good point as well. Uh, hi to Chris, hi to David Stanford, uh, to Martin, to Moinga. How you doing, Moinga? Uh, cartoon drunk as well. A lot of chat about this on Twitter. Go to twitter.com, put Richie Allen Show, all one word in press centre. Hi to Faisal as well. A um, lot, of, lot of stuff out there today about Syria. And um, again, if you want to engage with people on Twitter, just go and see what people are tweeting to me. It was announced today that Monroe Bergdorf is stepping down from an LGBT advisory board which was assembled by Shadow Women and Equality Secretary Dawn Butler. Now, Monroe Bergdorf has been very controversial. Uh, Bergdorf is a trans woman who transitioned in her early 20s. There was murders when she was appointed because she'd said some things on social media that people didn't like. Now, you can't have your cake and eat it. I'll come to that in a minute. But she had been sacked by L'Oreal advertising campaigns because she said that all whites were racist. Now, she posted a statement today, did Monroe Bergdorf. Um, she said she described her great sadness at her resignation, which she blamed on endless attacks on her character by the conservative right-wing press and relentless online abuse. That's what she blamed. Not her. She didn't do anything wrong or say anything wrong. But online abuse and the right-wing press did for her. That's what she said. She said, I, I refuse to be painted as a villain. Adding, I wanted my appointment to be something positive and exciting for the community. But instead, it has turned into nasty tabloid fodder blown out of all proportion. It was an unpaid role on the LGBT advisory board, Bergdorf would have joined other activists on the informal, informal even consultative group, which doesn't have a formal role within the Labour Party. She added, I accepted a place on the board. I felt it would be an exciting and effective way of helping to shed light on issues that I felt were being overlooked and hopefully push needs forward. Now, I personally... This is me. I can't have my cake and eat it. If you're going to 
criticise Twitter progressive lunatics who get people fired because of their opinions, well, then you can't triumphantly clap your hands when Labour says, well, we can't have this person on our LGBT advisory board. You can't have your cake and eat it, like I just said. But I believe she wasn't suitable anyway. Regardless of what she said or didn't say, she wasn't suitable to be talking about equality. And I'll tell you why. Because I've never believed that people like Bergdorf want equality. Now, I've spoken to trans women on this programme and I know uh, trans women through the programme, people who listen to the programme, and they do want equality. They just want to be treated like everybody else. But in the case of Monroe Bergdorf, she doesn't want equality. She wants to be allowed to order the world around her according to her narrow-minded view of how things work and how things should be. They want to inflict upon people a frame of mind, a mindset. They want people to think the way she thinks and the way she wants them to think. And also, she wants a world where she can do or say anything and then play the race card or the victim card when she is challenged. This is the essence of the identitarian, of the progressive, of the narcissist. And that's what she is. She doesn't have anything to contribute to any equality board and it was a dreadful appointment to begin with. But I'm not celebrating that people demanded on Twitter this woman was removed, this trans woman was removed and then she was because I would be a hypocrite. I don't believe that. Uh, I don't believe in people screaming on Twitter, ban him, uh, get rid of her. I don't believe in it. I'll never believe in it. Now, on the same track, the Huffington Post reported today, there is a headline, and the headline is, self-defining trans women to be allowed on Labour's all-women parliamentary shortlists. Historic National Executive Committee statement follows consultation and legal threats. Self-defining trans women to be allowed on Labour's all-women parliamentary shortlist. This is the Huffington Post story. Self-defining trans women will be given full rights by Labour, including guaranteed access to the party's all-women shortlists for parliamentary selections. HuffPost UK can reveal. In a historic move, the party's National Executive Committee is set to approve a statement that would allow people to self-identify without the need for medical or other certification, that they have changed their gender. In other words, they say, I've changed my gender. I'm now Rachel Allen, presenter of the Rachel Allen Show, and I would get full rights as a woman then. That's the way it is, right? The Rachel Allen Show. Yeah. Now, the formal recognition of full transgender rights is expected to be approved by the NEC's Equalities Committee at its meeting today, it was, and will be endorsed by the full NEC later on in March. This has been bitterly controversial, as you know, and feminists are not happy because they profoundly disagree with the concept of self-identification. As well as being fully guaranteed the right to take part in women-only shortlists, the party's formal decision will confirm that trans women can take part in the Joe Cox Women in Leadership programme. In its first public policy statement on the issue, the Labour Party wants to get, quote, ahead of the current law in a bid to enshrine new rights to combat discrimination. This is a, this is a madness, of course. It is a madness that people who say, I'm a woman... I, I, I now self-identify as a woman. There's been no consultation with anybody from a medical background. I've decided I'm a woman. Therefore, I can take part in women-only contests or I can take part in leadership programmes designed specifically for women. That is a madness. And I'm not... I'll tell you what I'll do. For the final time, I'll say where, where, where I am. Because I'm honest. I do not lie I do not play games, I don't virtue signal, and I don't try to curry favour with everybody. This is where I am. People should be allowed to live their lives however they want. Full stop. 
and they should be allowed to live their lives however they want without harassment or bullying or abuse from anybody else. Live your life, but don't inflict it on other people. What I mean by don't inflict it, let me tell you. Because conserv- conservatives will say, oh, they, 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 you're not to wear a dress in my presence. They can wear whatever they want. If they say to me, Richie, I'm now, I'm now Karen. I've always believed I'm a woman. Will you call me Karen? Yeah, of course I'll call you Karen. I have no problem with that. It's none of my business, of course. Karen, Karen it is. No bother. And you leave people alone. And I've always believed that. There's no but to that. However, this is lunacy. And it's good to see that people are going to social media and they're saying, you know what, I've been a Labour Party supporter for years, but this is beyond the pale. I'm sick of it. And I'm thinking to myself, maybe people will start to see through this agenda now. And again, I'm not trying to curry favour with anybody, but it's obvious to me that that trans women and trans men in the main don't really have any time for any of this nonsense. They don't want any part of it. It's not coming from them. You know, this city, you know, famous this city for its LGBT um, presence. If I say community, Andy Hunter will absolutely bottle me. <laughs> My friend from freestylehomes.com, Andy. If I say community, I'll get killed. Andy quite rightly says, there's no community. Gay men and women come from all different types of backgrounds, different political views, different opinions. But there's a big LGBT presence in the city and Canal Street is famous, famous district right in the heart of the city where there are a lot of gay bars and nightclubs and it's it's all lovely, nobody cares. Why would they? Um, And you don't hear any of this coming from LGBT people or trans people in Manchester, any of this nonsense you have to do this, we demand this, we demand that. They're too busy like everybody else trying to scrape a living, trying to pay the rent at the end of the month. Madness, isn't it? Let's move on, shall we? It's, um, what is it? Eight minutes at the top of the hour. Don't forget William Binney. Uh, Bill Binney joins us live in a few minutes' time. You don't want to miss him. So the Saudi Arabian visit then. <laughs> this is funny. Saudi Arabia is a basket case. Okay? It's where... All these jihadists came that have gone into Syria and Iraq and Libya. Lunatics trained in Saudi Arabia and trained in other places, parts of Turkey, I'm guessing. The Turks won't like that. Uh, Not that the Turks are listening to this. But in other places as well, maybe even in Israel. Um, Certainly. Jordan, maybe. And these lunatics, um, I mean, the Saudis are just, it's basket case country, right? basket case. Come on Saturdays to football pitches and watch poor bastards being beheaded for sod all because they were accused of taking drugs or they were accused of adultery or whatever. Lunatic country. Well anyway, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia is a guy called Mohammed bin Salman and he's he's hired some PR firm to make it look like he's reforming Saudi Arabia. Now you know this because I talked about this on recent programmes. And uh, he's trying to make it out like Saudi Arabia is going to modernise. We will allow women to go to football matches. We will allow women to drive, he says. Right. But he's had this, he's commissioned this huge advertising blitz, which some people are saying might be costing over a million pounds, which, which is nothing to the Saudi crown prince at all. And he's buying newspaper ads and prime billboard ads all around London ads that reflect upon him very favourably so the ads contain a picture of him Mohammed bin Salman and the hashtag a new Saudi Arabia it's a big charm push by the Saudi crown prince who's on his way to the UK to meet with the Queen and Theresa May on uh, Wednesday they love a good despot don't they of course we've sold billions of pounds worth of weapons to the Saudis which they've gone on a genocide spree in Yemen over the last few years which never gets talked about on mainstream media. So he's 32 year old is the prince he's painting himself as really cuddly he's on this diplomatic mission to show that we're really nice guys in Saudi Arabia. Yeah so it's a diplomacy thing however it doesn't appear that Saudi Arabia's foreign minister a guy called Adel al-Jubair 
he didn't get the message because he told Sky News' Dominic Waghorn that people who turn up to protest the Crown Prince on Wednesday are probably rent-a-crowd-paid protesters. He didn't get the edict or the posted message from the Crown Prince on the, on the diplomacy. Here's Adel al Jaber, Saudi Arabia's foreign minister, speaking with Sky. We're very bullish on Britain. Whether Britain is in the UE, EU or Britain is out of the EU, this is a British decision. We, be, we bet on Britain and we will continue this relationship and we will expect that this relationship will, will grow uh, even stronger uh, in the years ahead, whether Britain remains in the EU or whether Britain leaves the EU. Because Britain's going to be looking for partners after Brexit, can, they, can Britain rely on Saudi Arabia as much after Brexit as, as it has until now? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Our countries have been allies for many, many years. Our countries have relied in, on each other in many, many areas. Uh, this is, I don't expect this to change. I expect this to increase and to become even stronger. Are you nervous about protests? Do you think that the um, Crown Prince is prepared for the possibility of a thousand protesters outside Downing Street on Wednesday? This is a part of your traditions, and people protest in London all the time. I think, uh, and many of these protests are what I would call rent a crowd. You pay people and they come and show up. I would expect that there would be, there should be positive protests given the relationship between our two countries and given the, um, the policies that the, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince is implementing and pushing for in Saudi Arabia. I'm sorry, but you're saying that the protesters on Wednesday will not be genuine protests that are being paid for by by whom? No, I'm saying that, uh, I'm saying that uh, you have a tradition in this country of protest, and we respect that. I'm saying that there are situations where people rent people to protest, and so uh, we don't know what's ge what is genuine and what is not genuine. Yeah. <laughs> rent a crowd. If somebody is offering money to go to London to protest the Saudis, if there's a few bob in it, I'm always looking for a way to make an extra few bob. So if anybody can point me in the direction of somebody who's paying people to chant slogans at the Saudi Crown Prince on Wednesday, I'll be there. I'll be there in a heartbeat.